listening to the Critical Hour on Radio Sputnik. I'm Wilmer Leon, joined here by my co-host, Garland Nixon. Thank you, Wilmer. V.J. Prashad has a piece in People's Dispatch entitled Charting the Rise of Anti-French Sentiment Across Northern Africa. Anti-French sentiment has increasingly been on the rise across the Sahel and North Africa due to its role in destabilizing the region with military interventions. For insight into this, we turn to our next guest. He holds the John Jay and Rebecca Moore's Chair of History and African American Studies at the University of Houston. He's one of the most prolific writers of our time. His latest book is entitled The Counter-Revolution of 1836, Texas Slavery, Jim Crow and the Roots of American Fascism. Dr. Gerald Horn, as always, sir, welcome back. Thank you for inviting me. So VJ writes, coup d'etats in Northern Africa have been taking place for more than two years from the coup in Mali in August 2020, the coup in Burkina Faso 2022, the coups in the region, including Guinea 2021, as well as the two others in Mali and other and another in Burkina Faso, were driven in large part due to the anti-French sentiment in the Sahel. This is interesting to me in terms of where he places the responsibility because uh, there's an, there was a piece a while ago in The Intercept, U.S. trained officers have led numerous coups in Africa. U.S. involvement in recent years has only further destabilized the continent. And they talk about U.S. trained officers attempting five coups in West Africa, uh, Burkina Faso, Mali, and Guinea, Mauritania, and Gambia. Is VJ overlooking U.S. involvement? Is VJ not giving as much attention to American involvement in the similar countries where these coups have taken place? Or am I just mi- misreading this? Well, no, I-, I think that both of you are onto something. Obviously, the taproot of the problem is French colonialism and French imperialism. Uh, that is to say that. Uh, during the battle days of colonialism leading up to 1960 in the year of Africa, uh, France was running roughshod uh, over a good deal of West Africa. In fact, as we know, it's French neocolonialism that allows this middle-ranking power to pose on the world stage as being a major power. But what's happening now is also a reflection of the fact that with the unrest and instability in that part of Africa, France has had to call upon its comrade, speaking of the United States of America, to bolster its flagging fortunes. Uh, A couple of data points that are up to the moment. Uh, As we speak, Mali, which you mentioned and has been a real flashpoint with regard to conflict with French neocolonialism, is calling on the United Nations Security Council to have a meeting in order to investigate what the regime sees as unwarranted, illicit French interference in their internal affairs. Second data point, Madagascar, which is far distant from the Sahel, although it's a former French colony, Uh, You know that it's a gigantic island off the southeast coast of Africa, uh, not far distant from uh, Mozambique or even from South Africa, for that matter. What's interesting there is that the foreign minister has just been dismissed because, according to the president, he cast a vote at the General Assembly just a few days ago castigating Russia, and the president says that that did not follow instructions. Now, it's going to be interesting to see what happens to this foreign minister, what he was promised. Will he wind up with some sort of sinecure at Columbia University at a think tank in Washington, D.C.? But in any case, I think that that bespeaks what's going on in the world of both of these incidents, whereby you have African nations yearning and straining to be free of French neocolonialism and U.S. imperialism, but are being yanked, or there is an attempt to yank them back into line. Uh, I dare say that the yanking will not prove to be successful because France, as we speak once again, 
is enduring what amounts to a general strike, uh, something virtually unheard of in the capitalist world in recent years, basically a general strike because of the crisis of everyday living, the crisis of increases in energy uh, prices, uh, that is to say uh, heating and petrol for one's vehicle, and teachers and students and unions and all of the rest have taken to the street in the grand French tradition. And so Mr. Macron, the president of France, is quite occupied, it seems to me, with trying to keep a lid on the domestic revolt. And let's hope that that will forestall his ability to intervene and interfere more directly in the internal affairs of sovereign African nations. Dr. Horn, let me ask you this. You know, we recently saw, you know, a number of Caribbean islands say, we no longer want to be under the British crown. We're out, right? We see um, the, uh, uh, um, some of the Gulf states and the OPEC states saying to the U.S. for really the first time in many years, no, we will do what we want. We see the African nation saying, we want out, we're tired of this colonialism. Is, would it be, uh, uh, I'm, I'll put it like this. I'm assuming that as I see what's going on in Ukraine, they're looking and they're seeing somebody punch back at the U.S. empire. At the same time, they see dramatic weakness in the colonial powers as they have internal strife and infighting and blowing up each other's pipelines and, uh, uh, you know, stri strikes at home, that they're seeing an opportunity saying the big bully is in trouble. It's having problems. And now we want to make our move and try to jump ship now. What do you, am, I, am I wrong in connecting these things together? No, you're not wrong at all. And just to put it another way, I think that there's a reason why African and other states have legations and consulates and embassies in foreign countries. They're having these diplomats posted in places like Washington, D.C., so that they could take the temperature of what's going on, or posted in Brussels so they can take the temperature of the European Union. And when they do so, they see that the Western European countries are on the back foot, that Washington is on the back foot. They see that the warmongering policies of U.S. imperialism, uh, not only in Central and Eastern Europe, but all over the world, are coming up empty, they see that with regard to the Democratic Party in particular, that it has a fundamental contradiction insofar as the black community, which has been a stalwart and bulwark of the Democrats for decades, made a Faustian bargain some decades ago to stay away from sticky foreign policy matters in return for anti-Jim Crow concessions. But that bargain has expired, but the black leadership and the black intellectuals do not want to acknowledge reality. And so that helps to empower the warmongers in the Democratic Party, Victoria Newland, to cite one example, who has been up to our eyeballs in terms of interfering in the internal affairs of Ukraine and helping to instigate this crisis, and so, as these African and Caribbean nations survey the landscape, they have correctly come to the conclusion that uh, the ability of the North Atlantic countries to shape the global correlation of forces is waning, particularly in the face of the rise of the People's Republic of China, the rise of BRICS, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa. You see that as well with regard to Saudi Arabia thumbing its nose at Mr. Biden and deciding to go in a direction with regard to oil supply that Mr. Biden objected to. Uh, you should also watch out very carefully in the next few weeks and months for attempted coups. You mentioned at the top the attempted coups and successful coups in West Africa. Uh, I dare say that the Central Intelligence Agency is putting a plan on Mr. Biden's desk as we speak with not only with regard to regime change, perhaps in Saudi Arabia, believe it or not, but also in Turkey. And I recall that in Turkey, uh, in 2016, there was a U.S.-assisted coup that barely flopped. And so 
the instability will continue, but whether or not the U.S. imperialist hegemony will continue is a separate item. And I'm glad you made the, the the point about the other rising countries because I think that was that's important to Garland's point. What has I think given a lot a lot of the African countries the change in worldview is the fact that China is now in these countries, Russia is in these countries, engaging in relationships, and they're there as very strong players in the game. So I think that also goes a very long way in terms of changing their uh, their Weltanschauung or their or their worldview, and and giving them a a strong alternative to turn to. Uh, but with that, EU's Borrell says his disputable metaphor comparing non-EU world to jungle was misrepresented. Uh, he says some have misrepresented the metaphor as colonial Eurocentrism. I'm sorry if some have felt offended, I believe, and have said, for instance, the EU ambassadors last week that we are now too Eurocentric and need to be humbled and get to know better the rest of the world, including the global South. Um, sounds as though he's saying, I'm sorry if you misunderstood what I said, or I'm sorry if you were offended by what I said. He's not changing what he said. Well, clearly not. But I think that it's heartening the kind of pushback that he's received. As a matter of fact, it would not surprise me at all if Mr. Burrell was given a pink slip, that he was sent into a comfortable retirement, which he so richly deserves after carrying water so assiduously and avidly for world imperialism for years now. With regard to your previous point, I think it's worth mentioning that the rise of China is apparently helping to shape U.S. policy. What I mean is, Recall that still part of the fundamental rhetoric of the United States is the so-called free market economy, which we all know is more or less a fantasy, but that's the rhetoric. Uh, that is to say, the United States supposedly has been against industrial policy, having the government play a more muscular role in the economy. But what's happening is that as China uh, is in the passing lane, where the government plays the leading role in the economy, particularly towards the commanding heights of the economy, you see that the U.S. Trade Representative Kathleen Tai, appointed by Mr. Biden, is speaking more in terms of industrial policy. And you see that in terms of the CHIPS Act as well, where the United States is trying to compete more effectively with China with regard to CHIPS, which is important for everything from uh, guided precision missiles to email and iPhones. The United States is trying to, in the uh, language and the lingo of the so-called free market advocates, picking winners and losers. It's shoveling our tax money into the pockets of private corporations, a, a kind of industrial policy that on the surface uh, is in conflict with free market ideology. And so when African and Caribbean nations see this, if they see, as I'm sure they do, that the United States is trying to be more like China in order to compete with China, well, then they say, well, perhaps we should try to be more like China, too, because obviously this so-called superpower in Washington is having to bend the knee. And so, therefore, there is a fundamental change in the world correlation of forces that we would all be remiss if we ignored. Dr. Gerald Horn, as always, thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate that analysis, and we look forward to having you back. Thank you.